Well, there are a bunch of glaucomas that don't really fit into a little bag, and so I've put them together here as miscellaneous secondary glaucomas. And for some of them, there's almost nothing to say. So these are the topics, iridoschisis, posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy, ciliary body swelling, anti-VEGF injections. The last three, I'm just going to have one slide on. Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, schwartz matsuo syndrome, and posterior masses. So iridoschisis is an interesting disease. It's very rare, as most of these are. typically occurs in elderly individuals and the inferior iris felt that there may be because of sun exposure, actinic damage to the iris. And in iridoschisis, the anterior iris stroma splits from the deeper layers. The fragmented iris and pigment can impair trabecular outflow, causing a secondary open angle glaucoma. This is the most dramatic uroschisis that I've seen. You can see that it's the inferior iris and it looks like someone just scrambled the iris. On the gonio view on the right, you can see that these fragments are up touching the cornea. The other possible glaucoma mechanism is that the anterior lamella can split but not fragment and overlie the trabecular meshwork causing angle closure. This is the fellow eye of that person who I just showed you. And in this eye, the anterior iris has split from the posterior iris, is bowing forward, like in the sketch on the left, but is not yet fragmented. And in theory, this can cause an ankle closure glaucoma, but I've never seen that. Just another picture in a darker iris, a little bit more typical iridoschisis picture here, courtesy of Rob Honkinen. Glaucoma develops in about half of those who are affected. And the iris touching the cornea, as in this picture I showed a few minutes ago, can lead to corneal decompensation. So if we need to do anything for the glaucoma surgically, we would usually trim this iris tissue back and get it off of the cornea. Again, a very, very rare disease. Posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy also known as PPMD, is rare, bilateral angle closure. These patients develop epithelial-like corneal endothelium that grows as a membrane across the angle, much like ICE syndrome. These patients, though, the disease is bilateral, often familial, and they don't tend to have the iris changes that one sees typically in ICE syndrome and they develop synechial angle closure. It's autosomal dominant or sporadic, and 14% get glaucoma. Their symptoms usually come from corneal decompensation, and when we examine them, we see these endothelial vesicles or blisters. You can see this in this photograph from Jay Cratcher on the right. They can form in lines, or they, and they can have surrounding corneal edema. And I'll have a few examples here. You can see these blisters on the cornea here that are in linear shape. A few more examples. This is a patient with pretty marked corneal changes from posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy. It turns out that in Iowa, there are pockets of uh, families with PPMD, so it's not that rare for us to see, but it's uh, not a common disease. This is pretty end-stage changes in the cornea. The angle one can see, synechial angle closure, Here's another patient. You can see these blisters on the cornea and these lines. And you can notice here that the iris is all the way up against the cornea. So the angle is closed in this region.
the iris itself looks pretty normal. And the angle is extensively closed with these synechia. We treat it like ice. It's a chronic angle closure glaucoma. It's, in my experience, less aggressive than ice syndrome. These patients frequently need corneal transplants. Ciliary body swelling we touched on in the section on surgery because it can be seen after retinal surgery, particularly scleral buckling procedures and panretinal photocoagulation. When bilateral, one needs to consider systemic medications and especially topiramate or topamax. So if we see somebody who presents with a history of bilateral angle closure, uh, one really needs to investigate medications and particularly topiramate. Some of the sulfa drugs and other drugs can do this, but the classic is topamax. This is used for depression and seizures. These patients often have induced myopia because the lens has moved forward. And if they're going to get it, they usually get it within the first month of being on Topamax. We treat it with cycloplegia and steroids. We can do iridoplasty. If there are choroidal effusions, they can be drained. If they have a scleral buckle, that can be adjusted. But no cholinergics like pilocarpine. It's not pupillary block, so they don't need a laser iridotomy, just to emphasize that. Anti-VEGF injections, as we know, these are very, very common now, very effective at uh, reducing retinal vascularization. The effects on intraocular pressure are really just being understood. In, in the big initial trials of these medications, there were patients who had elevated intraocular pressures. Uh, a recent post, uh, prospective study looked at a group of patients who were being treated with anti-VEGF agents, and after a mean of 6.7 injections, almost 5% of these patients had elevated intraocular pressures, and that was especially common in people with pre-existing glaucoma. So we just need to keep our eyes open for this because we have retina clinics completely full of people getting injections every day, and some of them are going to get elevated pressure. And the peak pressure was correlated very statistically in this study with the number of injections. These last three, I'll just have one slide each about them. Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy makes the, makes the cornea thick, and if you have an angle that's already somewhat narrow can cause angle closure. Really anything that thickens the cornea can do that. Schwartz-Matsuo syndrome, sometimes called Schwartz syndrome, is again really uncommon. It occurs in a situation where there's a regmatogenous retinal detachment. And this great photo from uh, Bryce Kritzer in our photo lab it shows his retinal break here with a detachment and outer segments of photoreceptors are freed up and if they have access to the anterior chamber can plug the trabecular meshwork. On exam it looks like cell, but AC taps have demonstrated that these are outer segments of photoreceptors. And the treatment, like everything, is aqueous suppressants, but in this case fixing the retinal detachment. And then posterior masses can cause glaucoma. Superchoroidal hemorrhage is seen here. And we've talked about tumors in the section on tumors and cysts. So this is a group of pretty rare things that can cause glaucoma, but all things that you need to at least have one little part of your brain assigned to.